I'm finding it interesting that we're in this period of time right now where books are being banned. I feel like we're in 1930s not, uh, Germany. Yeah. I feel like we're, 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 you know, gas prices, inflation, yeah. <laughs> books are being banned. It's like division. We mm -hmm. got fascists, uh, storming capitals and things, uh, brown shirts uh, emerging. Where, where are we in history? If you, if you, you know, knowing what you do about yeah. American history and world history, where are we right now? Well, you know, it's as an historian, it's, it's tough to say where we are in the middle of the stream. And, and I, I'm always a little reserved on this because I know how many bad predictions people have made in the past. Um, and so my training's in hindsight, it's tough for me to make predictions, but it, this is a, an alarming moment. I mean, we're in, a, uh, we're in a pattern that we've seen before and, and it's often ended very poorly. Uh, and so the rise of authoritarianism, the rise of, yeah, I think fascism, uh, the, the, the challenges to democracy, uh, the pushback against voting rights across the country is is really alarming. Um, the kind of, and this and it goes back to that again, white flight. I wrote this book, and the first chapter is about how there are neo Nazis in Atlanta, and the the Klan revives, but they're kind of quickly sidelined. Nobody wants to wear the swastika or the, or the lightning bolt insignia. Nobody wants to put the hood on anymore. It's too obvious. Well, the Klan has come back. Neo Nazis have come back, right? And and, and so when I wrote that book about fifteen years ago, I thought. Oh, but, you know, this has all been relegated to the past. It's now much more subtler and, and, and stronger as a result. No, we've gone right back to that really overt, shocking racism. And so that has, has really kind of thrown me for a loop that these things that which five, 10 years ago would have been completely out of bounds have quickly become normalized. Um, and that's the real danger here, I see, is that if we take this long view of history, um, we're getting back to a place where um, it didn't turn out well the last time. And I don't think we want to be there again. So we, I think we really all need to be on guard about it. Part of that, though, I think I had Brian Karam, uh, journalist, on before you. Part of that, I think the media uh, is at fault because they don't, these people never went away. Yeah. Like I have this book without sanctuary, I talk about frequently, uh -huh. you know, and I look at the massive amount of people that show up for a lynching with yeah. their children. And they, they have postcards, and there's yep. like thousands of people that show up. And I'm like, those kids grew up. They're mm -hmm. still there. They're yeah. still out there. Now they may put on a suit and tie, mm -hmm. you know, they may, you know, become corporate lawyers or what have you, but that mentality hasn't died. It just was not popular. Right. And then you have somebody like Trump that gives them license to be yeah. as egregious. And now I can fly my Confederate flag. Mm -hmm. I can even take it to Canada, which that yeah. didn't make any sense. How, why right. is there a Confederate flag flying in Canada if it doesn't have anything to do with a particular ideology, right. if it's about heritage, if it's about the South and heritage, how is it in the, in, in Canada yeah. talking about rights? Hmm, something else is going on. I think we should always expose the folk. And I think it's the good white people who know that their uncle, or yeah. you know, know that the vast majority of their relatives at, at Thanksgiving dinner is, is the problem yeah. that we never talk about it though. Mm -hmm. So it's always been there. Yeah, no, I think that's right. I think that's right. Yeah, we really have seen a, it's both, it's, I think it's Trump and the media. You put your, your, your hands on, on the two big ones here. And both of them effectively normalized what used to be marginalized. We've always had racists and cranks and conspiracy theorists in, in America. It just used to be, you know, like the, the John Birch Society used to have like a newsletter that was mimeographed and that's how you got it. it they didn't have their own like giant radio station and, and, and cable news station broadcasting the stuff 24 hours a day. There wasn't, and the media didn't take the kind of both sides approach here. They would say this is wrong, right? And, and there wasn't an effort to kind of balance it out. And Trump, as you noted, gave a lot of these people license. Uh, and he, I, I keep thinking of him as, as George Wallace uh, and, and these rallies he throws remind us just how close that comparison is. People used to write about George Wallace and say, he lets people say, or he says what they're secretly keeping inside. He articulates their darkest hates their deepest secrets he promises revenge that was a, a, a reporter wrote that about george wallace trump does the same thing revenge and he for what though what's the revenge revenge for what well for whatever imagined slight i mean there's a there's a, a a tendency here for the people that are being appealed to by this to think of themselves as not only victims but the greatest victims right that they have been done wrong so in wallace's time it was that uh, you know, Lyndon Johnson had opened the government up to, uh, to, to give benefits to African Americans and other racial minorities, finally. Uh, and there was a sense that this was a zero-sum game, that every gain for Blacks was going to be taken out of whites, and it was going to be 
uh, robbing them. The same thing is happening uh, now. Uh, some are overt, overt about it, some aren't, but it's a sense that any gain, uh, you look at Black Lives Matter, right? The, the, the Black Lives Matter motto was just saying, hey, we should care if an African-American is killed by the police, right? That's not a big ask, I think. And yet the response to that was, well, all lives matter, as if white were being killed by police in the same numbers, or blue lives matter, as if people were ignoring, as if police departments and judges were ignoring the murder of police officers, right? And so it's this false equivalency of, of saying that we're victims too. In fact, we're the greatest victims now, or that you, how dare you call out racism? That means you're the real racist, on and on, you know? Uh, and it's a sense that they are uh, the hardest put upon. These people who are rebelling against vaccine mandates, as if it's someone out to get them when it's an effort to try to save their lives and the lives of people around them. Again, it's just, we're looking for, uh, they're looking for a way to be the victim uh, and to play the victim. And people like Trump, people like Wallace played right into that. So what do we do with this? We're talking with Kevin M. Cruz. He's a professor. His latest book is One Nation Under God. I want to talk to you about that as well. What do we do with this, especially now? All right, Black History Month. We have, uh, you know, critical race theory, which is a law school uh, curriculum. Yeah. Uh, so they ban they're banning it in schools that it would never be taught in any way. Right. But what they don't want to teach is the truth and the history that George Washington owned people. So did Thomas Jefferson. Right. He raped people. He had children with people that, you know, couldn't say no. And yes, found framers of the Constitution were also complicated people. And we need to talk about all of it because that's what history is. Uh, you know, we got to digest yeah. it all. Now you want to ban everything from mouse to the new kid, which Jerry Kraft mm -hmm. is such a nice guy. I'm like, why would yep. you ban the new kid to, to kill a mockingbird? Right. Are you kidding me? How are we Perennial. banning that? Yeah. But talk about where we are and what it means that we are here right now. What do we do with this? Uh, I mean, we're here, we shouldn't be mistaken this. We're here because of an organized campaign to get us here. This didn't just unfold. This is an effort on the part of, 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 of some partisans uh, on the right to distract, to diffuse the, the kind of the pushback against Trump and Trumpism. And this is a shiny object that will get votes. Um, but like you said, if you're worried that your child, if you're upset your child is learning critical race theory, congratulations on having a child currently in law school because it's not being taught anywhere else, right? Um, and if you're concerned that your child is, is, is getting some kind of critical race theory uh, precepts in school, um, I'd encourage you to understand what that is, right? I, I keep on hearing these white parents say, I don't want anyone to make my child feel guilty. Well, first of all, if you're reading a story about slavery or segregation, and you're worried that your child is identifying with the enslavers or with the Klansmen or something like that, maybe you ought to pump the brakes and, and think about why that might be, right? My kids read books about Rosa Parks and MLK and slavery, and at no point, did they say, dad, this makes me feel guilty because I think I'm just like the enslaver, right? That's such a weird mindset to begin with. But if you are worried that your child is being made to feel guilty about their race, then critical race theory is exactly what you should embrace. Because critical race theory says as a starting point, racism isn't just about what individuals do. Racism is about the structural inequalities that are deeper than individual people, right? That's what it is. That's what it means to take a critical race theory look at something, to look at the institutions. And again, if your kid was responsible for redlining in the 1930s, if your kid wrote racist district court opinions in the 1950s and 60s, then yes, we're talking about your kid. But if your kid isn't, say, 120 years old, we're not talking about your kid, right? And in fact, to understand racism now, we're looking at those structures, right? And so there's this pushback to say, well, don't teach critical race theory, which they're lying about. It's not what they say it is. Instead, we need to teach Martin Luther King. Great. Yes, teach Martin Luther King Jr. I'm all in favor of that. If that's the window you're giving us here, let's lean in. This was it. Texas said, you know, we want to we want to assign the I have a dream speech and the letter from a Birmingham jail. Great. I absolutely think Texas politicians should read those two speeches. <laughs> I think they're going to be really surprised by what they find, right? There's a lot of stuff that they think is critical race theory in those speeches. I know they think the I have a dream speech is just that one line. He talks about poverty. He talks about police brutality. He talks about voting discrimination. 
You want critical race theory? The letter from a Birmingham jail is it. It talks about how laws may appear to be not at all racist on the surface, but they have racist intent. That's critical race theory in a sentence, right? And, and there are lots of complaints in there about white moderates who don't want to learn the ugly parts of history, right? Does that sound familiar? About the way in which racism is embedded in the institutions of America? Does that sound familiar? Yeah, it is. So yeah, if you're saying we can't teach critical race theory, but we have to read Martin Luther King Jr., great, let's read them. Let's really ah, dig in and read them. I love it. I love it. You have written uh, on Twitter a lot. and Y'all can follow him at Kevin M as in Mary Cruz, K-R-U-S-E, uh, about the filibuster and its racist roots. And I had yeah. originally reached out to you to come on and talk about it just for those because I'm, I'm, I'm baffled why this president wouldn't push more yeah. to end this whole filibuster situation. What are the roots of the filibuster to begin with? And how can we make that into a short enough message to keep beating that drum so yeah. that because nobody wants to really be racist, right? No, no, no. Well, and this is the thing is that the filibuster is supposed to be this kind of noble tradition. Joe, Man Joe Manchin keeps talking about how the filibuster has been there from the start. No, it has not been there from the start. The filibuster comes about largely through an accidental rewriting of the rules of the Senate. And John C. Calhoun, the number one defender of slavery in the antebellum period, picks it up and runs with it. And he runs with it for a reason. The filibuster is anti-democratic. The, when, when Manchin and Sinema talk about Oh, the filibuster is good for compromise. That create no, it's not. The filibuster shuts down negotiation. The filibuster makes sure nothing happens, and that's why people like John C. Calhoun loved it because it kept slavery from being ended. That's why segregationists like Strom Thurmond love it because it's anti-democratic because it keeps the full Senate from having a vote. It keeps people out here from having voting rights too, and so they embrace it. And so it's not that the <clears throat> the filibuster itself is inherently racist, but the filibuster has been the number one tool of racists. And it's been the number one tool of racists, again, because it essentially undermines the democratic project. The Senate was meant to run on simple majorities. The founders are very clear on this. This idea that you have to get 67 or 60 or whatever votes it is, uh, you know, at any one point in time, and it changes, is opposed to what the founders wanted from the, from the Senate, right? And so, in fact, the, the name filibuster is a great clue to this. A filibuster in the 19th century was a pirate, right? And so if you're a filibusterer, you're a pirate. You're hijacking the Senate. You're searing it away from where it wants to go and taking it to your own ends, right? And so throughout the years, pro-slavery, pro-segregation people repeatedly use the filibuster to stop civil rights gains. 